Well, good morning. Good to see you all. You can join me in opening your Bibles. We'll be in Romans chapter 8 this morning, and if you don't have a Bible, you can grab one from a seat nearby. Romans chapter 8 is on page 944 in those Bibles. Well, last Sunday we began our series in this chapter. Romans 8 is one of these mountain peak chapters in the Bible. We're seeing that this chapter brings two realities together that are powerful when combined, but so often separated in the lives of Christians or churches or traditions through church history. We tend to separate these two realities, rich theology and profound and powerful experience. So this is one of the most doctrinally rich chapters in the Bible that takes thinking and logic and theology seriously, and it also speaks to the experience of life empowered by the Holy Spirit. So this chapter holds forth to us, uh, for us, both doctrine and experience and practice. So this is not just for theology-minded people, nor is it just for experientially oriented people. It's for all of us, and it's calling all of us, no matter where we may lean, to bring both of these realities together, because bringing them together is where power is. They belong together. So let's think deeply about Christian doctrine, and let's expect and experience the power of the Holy Spirit. So let's, um, let's pray before we go further this morning. Our Father, we thank you so much for Romans chapter 8. We thank you for the truths that it speaks of. We also thank you for <clears throat> leaving this word for us, breathed out by you, inspired, inerrant, faithfully preserved, and translated for us today. So we pray that you would work by your Spirit to form our minds, form our hearts, and form our lives as a result of being together here. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, last week we saw in verse 1 that God solved a fundamental problem in human history, a problem that everyone has. We have objective guilt before God for our sin, and every single person rightly deserves to be eternally condemned for their sin. But those who are united to Jesus Christ through faith won't experience that condemnation. We are taken out of the realm of condemnation. We are put into a whole new realm in Christ Jesus where condemnation is no longer over us. This is incredibly great news, but it's not the whole of the good news. When God saves us, He gives us freedom in two ways, not just one. We are not just guilty and in need of forgiveness. We are enslaved and in need of freedom. We don't just need release from the penalty of sin. We need to be liberated from the power of sin. So here's how we sing it in the older hymn, Rock of Ages, and we'll sing this after the message today. Puts it this way, Rock of Ages cleft for me. So this um, area kind of in the side of a mountain or rock that we can hide in, cleft for me. Let me hide myself in thee. This picture almost of union with Christ, refuge in Jesus. Let the water and the blood from your wounded side which flowed, let that be of sin the double cure. What's the double cure? Save from wrath and make me pure. So salvation is a double cure. The first part is being saved from God's wrath, and the other part is being made pure. So no longer being condemned for our sins, and then also being liberated from the corrupting power of sin in our lives. So the good news of the gospel includes, but is not limited to, forgiveness. It also includes transformation. And this is what Romans chapter 8, verses 2 to 4 show us. So this is the very practical hope that you and I need. So many of us wonder if we can really change, if transformation is really possible. We may say, okay, we see it in some other people, but not for me. Can I really change? 
Or am I just trying to get away from myself and I'll never work? Can I actually be free from these patterns, these ruts, these negative emotions, these sins? Is it possible? The good news of the gospel is that it absolutely is possible. And for all who are in Christ, it is guaranteed. There is a double cure. So Romans 8, 2 to 4 show us that God wants us to know this freedom and to live in it and enjoy it. So let's read these verses. We'll start in verse 1, since it's all tightly connected here. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the Spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. For God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do, by sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, or for sin offering, He condemned sin in the flesh, in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit." So God has brought this double cure we all need, so here's a few questions that this text answers about that. So what is it, where did it come from, and why do we have it? So first, what is it? What is the double cure? Well, a double cure assumes a double problem. What's our double problem? The Bible is clear from the beginning that once sin entered the world, we have two problems, not one. One problem is that because we all sin, we deserve judgment. And eternal death, in the very beginning, God gave Adam a command, and He said, you can eat of all the trees in the garden except one, and if you eat of that one, in the day that you eat it, you'll surely die. So death is the just consequence of sin. The way that Paul put it earlier in Romans is the wages of sin is death, and not just physical death, but eternal death. And so ever since Adam did disobey God, Everyone has now sinned, and we all deserve death. We are all under condemnation. But there's another problem. The very fact that everyone sins shows us that we are all slaves of sin. That's how Jesus put it. Remember what He said about anyone who sins? Anyone who sins is a slave of sin. It's Romans 8, or John 8. Ever since Adam sinned, we're all born with a sin nature inclined to sin, which is why nobody except the Lord Jesus Christ has lived a sinless life. We're under its power. We're under its rule. So this is our double problem. We need to be delivered from the penalty of sin, the wages of sin being death, but also this corrupting power of sin, and this is what God's done for us. So let's walk through the logic here in verses 1 and 2. Uh, together here because they're tightly tied together. So in verse 1, he says, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So this emphasizes the first cure. We're liberated from the condemnation of sin. We're liberated from being declared guilty in the cosmic law court, sentenced to eternity of judgment. The positive way to say this is that we are justified. To be justified is to be declared not guilty, but righteous. And in the right. But Paul is not just thinking about freedom from the penalty of sin. He's also thinking about freedom from the power of sin here. And this becomes more explicit in verse 2. He says, For the law of the Spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. So Paul's giving a reason for what he just said in verse 1. There is no condemnation for those in Christ because we have been set free in Christ. The language he uses here may not sound straightforward at first, though, and the challenge, one of the challenges, is with the way he's using this word law. Paul uses that word in a number of ways in different places here, and it doesn't always refer to the same exact thing. So sometimes he uses it to refer to the Mosaic law, so the law that God gave Israel in the Old Covenant. Sometimes he refers to a power or a rule with the word law. I think he's using it here to refer to a rule or a power or a reign. So translate the word law as rule, and you can hear more clearly what he's saying. For the rule of the spirit of life 
has set you free in Christ Jesus from the rule of sin and death. Right? The authoritative power and dominion, the rule of the Spirit, has liberated you from what was previously ruling you. You were liberated from that rule and authority and power. And that was, in particular, sin and death. So that's the double cure. What's the rule of sin? Well, it's the power of sin reigning over us, enslaving us. What's the rule of death? It's the condemnation of death that we deserve for our sin. We're enslaved under the power of sin, and we have this deadly verdict of condemnation. And Paul is saying, it's over. It's broken. The penalty and the power. And this fits with the flow of his thought from chapter 7, Paul has been describing what life is like apart from this deliverance. He says that sin was a powerful ruling force in life. It makes us captive. It enslaves us. And we do not have the power to break free from it. And so he cries out at the end of chapter, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? He's not just longing for forgiveness there. He's crying out for transformation. He wants to be liberated, not just from the penalty of sin, but the power of sin and its grip on his life. Do you ever experience that? And now verses 1 and 2, Paul says the deliverance has come. The rule of the Spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the rule of sin and death. And this is all found through union with Christ. It's through being found in Christ. We saw this last week in verse 1. It's mentioned again in verse 2. Notice again, this says that we've not only have no condemnation in Christ, but we've been set free in Christ Jesus. So that phrase, in Christ, repeated all over the New Testament. The idea is that we're taken out of a previous realm and we're put into a new realm. One way to think of it from Romans 5 is we were in Adam condemned in sin and enslaved, and now we're taken out of Adam and we're placed in Jesus where there's now no condemnation and there's freedom. I was talking with my boys about this a couple nights ago. We're just kind of slowly reading through Romans 8 in light of the sermon series, and I said that we're born in one realm. Everyone's born in one realm, and it's the realm of sin and death. And then God plugs us in to Jesus And there's absolutely no condemnation in that realm that we're plugged into. It's irrelevant to us. Even when you sin again, it can't take you out of Christ and put you back into Adam. You're not going to get transferred back. Once you're in Christ, always and forever in Christ. And one of my boys said, sin is like a cricket trying to pull out a cord that's plugged into an outlet. I said, that's pretty good. I like that. doesn't matter how many crickets you have trying to pull that cord out. It's not coming out. Once you're in Christ, you're in there. And here's the amazing reality. When were you, see, I asked my boys for illustrations because I can't do them on my own. So, get them from them. Here's the reality, though. When we're united to Jesus, we get both of these blessings. And not even just limited to these, but both of these blessings, not just one. John Calvin refers to the double grace that we get in being united to Jesus. So, here's how he put it. Christ was given to us by God's generosity to be grasped and possessed by us in faith. And by partaking of Him, we principally receive a double grace, namely, that being reconciled to God through Christ's blamelessness, we may have in heaven, instead of a judge, a gracious Father. So, no condemnation, but a gracious Father. Secondly, that sanctified by Christ's Spirit we may cultivate blamelessness and purity of life. And he's saying we get both of those when we grasp Jesus. When you come out of Adam and get slotted into Christ, you get both the Father as a gracious Father and no longer condemnation, and you also get the Holy Spirit to transform you to live a pure life. This clears up a common misunderstanding. Some have taught that salvation is about being justified, but then transformation is optional. They would say that some people receive Jesus as Savior, but not as Lord, 
And it's always a good idea to receive Jesus as a Lord too, but not all of them do it. Or they say you can be freed from the penalty of sin without being saved from the power of sin. Or that there's two kinds of Christians. There's the Christians who are forgiven, but still live enslaved to sin. They're called carnal Christians, fleshly Christians. And then there's some who are spirit-led or spirit-filled and experience the liberation from sin's power. But the heart of the book of Romans and the argument that we get in the book of Romans and right here is that we get both deliverances. If you are united to Jesus, you are both forgiven and transformed, and you never have one without the other. In theological terms, you never get justification without regeneration and sanctification. So justification, declared righteous, forgiven. Regeneration, given a new heart. Sanctification, being transformed to become more and more like Jesus. This also teaches us that we always then have to hold these two things together, not just theologically, but very practically in our lives. We should be enjoying these two realities and seeking these two, seeking to enjoy these two realities. Even in the Lord's Prayer, Jesus taught us to keep both of them together. We're to ask, forgive us our sins and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. It's a prayer for forgiveness, past sin, power to avoid further sin. So whenever you sin, pray two things to the Lord, not just one. Confess the sin and ask for fresh forgiveness and enjoyment of justification, but also ask for transformation. When we um, correct our boys, this wasn't something that I was doing right away. I wanted to lead them in prayer uh, after we corrected them, and so I would um, invite them and lead them to ask for forgiveness from the Lord because they sinned against Him, not just me or Christina or one of the brothers. Um, but then I realized over time that, that is real, that's leaving the root issue of transformation unaddressed. Are we just supposed to wait till the next time it happens? Just be like, well, we're not going to change, so we'll just keep asking for forgiveness each time we do it. Um, or are we supposed to think, okay, he's forgiven. Now I've got to try really hard not to do it in my own strength. Or are we just hopeless to change? It's like, well, now that, now that I've asked for forgiveness for the same sin 30 times, is it going to be 3,000 times? Am I ever going to be free from this? No, we ask God for two things now, not one. I lead my boys to ask for forgiveness and for change. And I'm doing that myself as well. We ask God, forgive me for this sin and help me not do it anymore. Help me no longer disobey you like this. So that's what it is, the double grace. And this is not perfection immediately. This is progression over a lifetime. We will not be perfect until Jesus comes and we see him face to face and the transformation process is complete. But in between, there's real progress that can be made. So that's the double cure. Now second, where did it come from? Well, it came from the work of the triune God. God has done it. He took the initiative. This was not our idea. We didn't get together and think, you know, it would be an amazing salvation, and then we can kind of think this up and maybe get excited about this. No, this was God's idea. This was His plan, and each person of the Trinity is engaged with it. Now, the word Trinity is, of course, not in the Bible, but that doesn't mean that the Trinity is not in the Bible. We refer to God as tr Trinity because that's clearly what the Bible teaches. And one way to see that, if you're curious, where do we find the Trinity in the Bible, is look at key texts, especially in the New Testament, but they reflect on the Old as well, where it shows how God works to save us. It's through the way that He saves and redeems His people that His triune nature is reflected clearly. So in text after text about salvation, we see the Father, the Son, and the Spirit working together. And we see this pattern in general of the Father planning salvation, and then the Son accomplishing it, or the Father accomplishing it through the Son's work, and then the Spirit engaged in that as well, but then especially applying it to our lives. And so we see that right here. We see the God the Father taking the initiative to do this, and it was accomplished through the death of Jesus, and then the Spirit frees us and transforms us to change. So Paul explains how God did this by saying that God did what the law could not do. So look at verse 3. For God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, 
could not do. By sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, or for sin offering, he condemned sin in the flesh. So let's walk through the logic of this verse. First, he says that God did what the law could not do because the law was weakened by the flesh. So he's referring to the Old Testament law here, and that law was good. It could do a lot of things. It reveals God's moral will for his people. It reflected God's character. It gave wisdom. But Paul here is referring especially to what the law couldn't do. What can't the law do? Well, the law can't forgive us, and the law cannot change us. Why not? Because of our sinful condition. He says here that the law was weakened by the flesh. So, the flesh, this is our human nature now corrupted by sin. The flesh refers to us, but now with our fallen moral capacities and enslaved to sin. So, what happens when God's good commands come to hearts like you and I have by default? Well, we don't want to obey it, and we can't. It just makes it worse because it reminds us of what we can't do, and it leads to our condemnation. Even if we want to obey it or when we want to obey, we can't pull it off. So the law is good, but when the law hits a sinful, hard heart, the heart resists it. We know this from experience. We know what it's like when we have tried to obey God's commands and failed. Parents know what it's like when no amount of repetition and no amount of yelling can actually get the smaller human to obey the command. There isn't anything wrong with the law. There's something wrong with the human heart. And the whole story of Israel in the Old Testament is a case study in this. What happened when God gave them his good law? From day one, they broke it. And then every generation after that. The fundamental problem in Israel's story is this. The law said, love God, love others. And they said, okay. And then they didn't do it. They couldn't do it. They resisted, they rebelled against God, and their society unraveled. Our problem is not that we lack enough religion and rules. Our problem of our culture and society is not mainly that they don't just know what God expects of them. Our problem is not that we don't know enough of what God expects of us. It's deeper. We need God to do what no religion could do. We need God to do what you and I couldn't do. So the law couldn't change us because of our sinful nature. So Paul's saying God then did what the law couldn't do. So the law is weakened by our flesh, can't change us, can't forgive us. God then did what the law couldn't do. How? Well, the answer is in Jesus' life and death. So, verse 3 says that the Father sent the Son, notice the phrase here, in the likeness of sinful flesh. Now, that's a very careful way of saying that Jesus was truly human, but not sinful. He was truly in the flesh, as other texts make very clear, but only in the likeness of sinful flesh, because he was without sin. And then he says that Jesus was sent for sin. It's most likely referring to Jesus being a sin offering. It's a language that was used throughout the Old Testament, referring to sin offerings. So, he died in our place. He was condemned in our place as our substitute, like a sin offering in the Old Testament, when an animal died in the place of the people. And in Jesus' death, this says, God condemned sin in the flesh. What a striking phrase. Sin itself judged and condemned, sentenced to death. There's a lot of mystery here, but we can get the heart of what Paul is saying. Sin is the problem, and God dealt with it through the cross of Jesus Christ. He judged sin through the death of Jesus, and this is how He sets us free from its penalty and power. So, last question, why did God give this? Why did he give this double grace, this double cure? Well, the answer is so that we would live a whole new life. A life freed to become like Jesus, a life freed to become truly human as we were meant to be, 
in order that we'd be transformed. This is verse 4. He did this in order that, so that's the purpose, in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. So what does it mean for the righteous requirement of the law to be fulfilled in us? Well, there's a few things Paul could mean by this. Some scholars take this to refer to Jesus fulfilling the law for us through his life and death, and then that therefore gets credited to us. But I think the, with most commentators, they're right in saying that this is referring to how Christians now fulfill the law as they live by the Spirit. In this sense, the righteous requirement of the law is the law as a whole, which calls for love. Paul will say in just a few chapters, in chapter 13, that love is the fulfilling of the law. And he says, the one who loves one another has fulfilled the law. So Paul's saying that this then happens by those who no longer live according to the flesh. But now, now that they're out of Adam, in Jesus and have been liberated, now they're living according to the Spirit. So the flesh is our sinful nature, but now in Christ we're set free and we're empowered by the Holy Spirit. We're free by the power of the Holy Spirit to walk in love. And we do this not in our own strength, but by the power of the Holy Spirit. And in walking in love by the power of the Spirit, we fulfill the law. And this is one of the central reasons why God has redeemed us and why he gave us the Holy Spirit. It's to transform us. It's to lead us, to enable us to fulfill the law, which is what he was always aiming for and what we were made to do. So this idea is probably rooted in the great expectations of the Old Testament prophets. Jeremiah 31, Ezekiel 36, and others identified the problem of the Old Covenant. The problem was not the law, but the people because the law was weakened by sinful flesh, and the prophets would promise this twofold cure. So here's the promise in Ezekiel 36. So here's God now saying that he's going to solve the fundamental problem of the old covenant. He says, I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I'll put within you, and I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh, and I will put my spirit within you And then listen to this. So the Holy Spirit given to God's people who get a new heart and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. This is at the heart of why we have the new covenant. We ate the Lord's Supper. Jesus said this is the blood of the new covenant. He inaugurated the new covenant in order to bring the blessing of both forgiveness and transformation by giving new hearts in the Holy Spirit to cause us to actually fulfill the law of love. This is part of the purpose of the cross throughout the New Testament. Collect every text you can find about the purpose of the cross, and you will find in many of them this emphasis repeatedly. It was a wholesale deliverance that we receive so that we can be forgiven and transformed. So here's a couple examples. 1 Peter 2.24 Christ himself bore our sins in his body on the tree. Why? Why did Christ bear our sins upon himself? So that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. Titus 2.14. Christ who gave himself for us. Why? To redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own possession who are zealous for good works. Total transformation. So that's the heart of the good news of the gospel. This is the heart of God's purposes in salvation. This is why Jesus came and lived and died and rose and poured out his Holy Spirit to give us both forgiveness and transformation. So let's wrap up with a few implications here. So I'm calling this series Gospel Doctrine and Life in the Spirit. And this chapter holds both of those together. It celebrates theology, the theology of the gospel, and then it leads us to live and enjoy this new life in the Spirit. So I want to draw attention to how these few verses do both of those things. So I just want to draw attention to the various doctrines that saturate these verses. And then I want to draw out some implications about life in the Spirit from this. So first category, 
gospel doctrine. We are not very long into this section in Romans 8, and there are a number of theological topics that are directly addressed here. And this section is not very long itself that we're looking at here. Three verses. But these three verses are saturated with doctrines that every Christian should become familiar with and study in depth over time. So, I want to list seven central doctrines that are right here in these verses. So, and there's a bit of a logical order here. So, if we start with Christ here, we see His incarnation. He, has, he was the preexistent one as the Son of the Father, whom the Father sent to be in the likeness of sinful flesh. So, His incarnation, truly human, truly divine. Second, we see His atonement. We see sin was condemned in the flesh as Jesus was given as a sin offering. And we can use the language um, that some theologians today use of penal substitutionary atonement. It's a helpful phrase because it identifies what the cross accomplished. Jesus died to take the penalty of our sin. He did that by being a substitute for us, by dying in our place, taking the penalty we deserve, and it accomplished atonement. So, penal substitutionary atonement. Third, union with Christ. So, Jesus has lived and died and risen, and now as we trust in Him, we're united to Him by faith. We're in Christ in this whole new realm of salvation where all the blessings flow. And here are some of the blessings. Four would be, the fourth doctrine would be justification. There's now no condemnation for Christians. We're justified, declared righteous. Regeneration, five, we're set free from the power of sin. We're given a new heart. Six is sanctification. This freedom leads to us fulfilling the law of love by the power of the Holy Spirit. So those are blessings that come through union with Christ. And then the seventh doctrine would be over all of these, and that's the doctrine of the Trinity. We read that the Father sent His Son to die for us, and the Spirit sets us free from the power of sin so that we walk by the Spirit. So the point of listing them here is just to show how central gospel doctrine is to the realities that are so life-giving. Doctrine doesn't need to be for stuffy intellectuals. It's for everyone, and it should lead us to worship. Second category, life in the Spirit. This section shows us that God has freed us from the power of sin so that the law would be fulfilled in those who walk by the Spirit. So, the purpose of the cross includes our transformation our holiness. So, here's four reflections about transformation and holiness in light of these verses here. First, this gives us the hope that transformation is possible. Many Christians live as though real change is not actually a possibility. Um, sometimes they can, we can be so aware of our sin and its lingering power in our life that we can act as though we're not actually free from it. Or we can actually make real strides as Christians, but we're so aware and weighed down by the remaining sin in our life, and we've become sensitive to it, rightly so, that there's a kind of humility that's a bit misguided that then can not honor the real good work the Holy Spirit's actually done in our lives. And we, we act and think and feel as though we've actually made zero progress. Now, it's interesting because actually the more we grow in Christ and by the Spirit, but the more sensitive we should become of our own sin. And therefore, we actually should feel like sin is a weightier problem. In a sense, we feel worse than we were before. We're actually getting better, though we feel worse, but it's not because we're sinning less. It's because we have a heightened sensitivity to our sin, and we're aware of more that was there. That should be happening as we grow as a Christian. But at the same time, we shouldn't neglect the work that God has actually done in our lives. The Holy Spirit has done transformational work, and we can see that and honor that. And we need to help one another with this. Sometimes you may be talking to a Christian friend who's just so weighed down and discouraged by their own sin, and you can encourage them and list the ways you have seen the Holy Spirit transform them. They're not who they once were. I know many of you have radically changed. You are not who you once were. So let's let this kindle hope. Transformation's actually possible here. Second, transformation is not, or at least not yet, about perfection. 
It's about progression. This doesn't mean that we can become perfect in this life. We can't. There's a sense in which we are already transformed, but not yet fully transformed. We have to wait until the return of Jesus for this transformation, sanctification process to be perfected. But we are on our way. So it's not, as um, one author's put it in the past, it's not perfection overnight, but progression over a lifetime. I think that's helpful. So we're, we're looking for real transformation and making real progress. Third, transformation is not optional. If you are set free from the guilt of sin, you are also set free from the power and rule of sin. If you are forgiven, if you are trusting Christ for the forgiveness of sins and you have received that, you are now someone who is to be someone who walks by the Spirit. There are not two kinds of Christians some who are delivered from the power of sin and some who aren't. There's not disobedient Christians and obedient Christians. There are Christians who have no condemnation and are liberated by the Spirit and have various degrees of progress in the Christian life. So this is against the whole grain of the New Testament and certainly Romans 8 to say that a Christian may not actually change. Paul is saying that every Christian gets this double liberation and the whole point of the cross is to give us both of these blessings. Here's how John Stott summarized our whole text. He said, this is not perfectionism. It's simply to say that obedience is a necessary and possible aspect of Christian discipleship. Although the law cannot secure this obedience, the Spirit can. Finally, transformation is joyful and dignifying. The reality of This liberation can change your life. In fact, knowing that transformation is possible because the Holy Spirit has been given to you, knowing that actually can fuel the transformation process. Because if you think you can't change, will you have the motivation to try? Or the right motivation? Will you rely on the Spirit to change you if you don't think He will or can or wants to? No. But if you know that you can and that God is for you, and He's empowering you, that gives you the energy and motivation to want to grow. So there's hope here. It's also dignifying and joyful because this is a restoration of who we were always made to be. This is, the, this is a project that God is undertaking to return humanity to the state we were in before sin entered the world, but even better, to become now like the Lord Jesus to become as true humans we're always supposed to be, and not just as individuals, but together as church families and as Christians interacting, becoming a new culture, a counterculture of light and life. And this reality is hope-giving because it means that you can step into each day with this over your head, and you can just say this to yourself. You are accepted. You are justified. There is no condemnation over you today. And you are empowered by the Holy Spirit to change. So that is life-giving, hope-giving, and joy-giving. And this whole picture here is a big salvation. So salvation is not, would anyone like a salvation card, right? If you believe the right things about Jesus, you can take this, get out of hell card, and put it in your pocket, and then go on with your miserable life. But knowing that when it ends, you won't be judged. No, this is way bigger than that. This is being united to the Lord Jesus Christ himself in this mysterious, wonderful, transformational union. This is you finding out that as you trusted in Jesus and as you've changed, you're caught up in a much bigger story that God has planned from eternity past. He wasn't just waiting for you to kind of take a card that he offers. He himself has planned all of this for you. He accomplished it in Christ. And now he's pouring out the Holy Spirit to give you a new heart and bring you to faith and transform you and secure you faithfully until the day of Christ so that you're with him forever, united in love. That's a salvation I wanted on. And that's what we get to enjoy together. So let's thank him for it. Our Father, we thank you for your great mercy and kindness to us. We thank you for your infinite wisdom to plan salvation and your power to unfold this in history. We thank you for the work of the Lord Jesus in becoming a human and being in the likeness of sinful flesh so that sin could be condemned in the flesh. 
And we thank you for the Holy Spirit's liberating and transforming power. So we pray that you would open our eyes to see the wonder of our moment-by-moment no condemnation and transformational life, and that it would result in praise to you, that we would praise you when, you see, when we see your work in one another's lives, and that we would praise you for your work in ours. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Please stand um, and think of the first uh, verse of this.